Well, welcome. It's another Black History Conversation today. It's going to be a really interesting one. Uh, we've already introduced ourselves, the folks who are um, uh, joining us today, and maybe a few more folks will join as we go along. I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International, and except for a couple of sessions, I've been here um, with Black History Conversations, and this is session 98. So we're getting a bit excited because we've got two more to go before we get to our hundredth session. The person truly to be congratulated though is Simon Fringo, who's been here for every single one of the, the 100 sessions. So I can't thank you enough. Well, been for 98 so far, Simon. Thank you very much indeed, Simon from Belong Nottingham and uh, his consultancy interest in uh, um, all sorts of things, including cotton. And he's told us about a number of the uh, interesting projects he's been involved in. So, right, welcome also. We've got the Windrush Allies Network colleagues with us, um, uh, June Elizabeth, uh, Whitesmith Gully, and uh, Roland um, and Garrick. So welcome to you too. And I'm sure at some stage you'll give us a bit of an update about what's happening. Um, so we're welcoming Michael and I'll say a little bit more Michael um, when I've just gone through this first introductory part. Um, it's great that you're able to join us. We're so interested about the John Blank project um, and we want to uh, find out how far you've got with it, where it's going and hear about the book of the project coming soon. Then, if we've got time, um, I've got a PowerPoint about the memories of authors who've joined us. Um, and we're looking at the best black history books you've come across. One of the things that we are doing, and I keep saying this and doing nothing about it, is to create a better website that isn't just a jumble, um, but actually has information. But it is such an enormous amount of work that I feel quite weak at the knees. So I only got through the first three seasons um, looking at which authors had joined us, but it's really interesting and remind us of some of the Black History books um, then. We may have time to catch up on some reparation news. We're moving ahead with a, a special conference in April. Um, it may be a part of the Black History Conversations, it may not. Um, it depends when the speakers can make it. Um, because it's the 85th anniversary of the presentation of the petition from the Penance community from Clarendon, Jamaica, to the Jamaican government, which was the British government at the time, in 1938, um, which caused the sale of the Penance plantations. And uh, it's fine. And we're also going to, as I say, take us up to 100 Black History Conversation sessions, and we're having break for a bit over Easter and then off we go again and we've got lots of ideas which have to be uh, firmed up to follow the the um, journey of the Windrush. We did it last year from leaving Jamaica and uh, looking at the other ports it called in at but then four weeks later we arrive in um, Tilbury. I'd also like to write a statement. This was a comment that came out of the um, last North Wales Jamaica Society meeting. Jackie Pennant, who's um, a member of that group, joined us from the States. And in a moment, I'm going to do the acknowledgement of country here, which you do before every single meeting, session, Zoom, whatever, in Australia. Um, and she said it would be good to write a statement to acknowledge, and I've put this wording, the challenges and tragedy experienced by people of African descent over the years. Now I worked on something last night with the group from the Penance Committee, but because my laptop's playing up, I can't find that it seems to have wiped it off. So um, maybe we can have a discussion about that in a moment. So to um, help you all to, uh, understand and recognize that I am acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land where I am in Australia, the country we call Australia now. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture of the Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the nation. 
And the next slide shows you just how many um, language speaking groups there are, cultural groups there are across the whole of Australia and the Torres Strait Island is at, Islands are right up at the top. So uh, that's uh, something to consider. And like Africa, Australia is really huge as well. Not as big as Aust uh, Africa though. We're also still in the decade of people from African descent. And I really think we need to um, perhaps take an opportunity and explore more about this and what's been going on for the last um, eight years, is it? Um, and and what will happen when that actually wraps up. So at this moment in time, before we do anything else, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask if anybody's got any thoughts or comments about the idea of having a statement um, which can be used at the beginning of sessions just to acknowledge and respect um, the people of, from Africa who over the centuries have been so disadvantaged. Any thoughts at all? Is it a good idea? No, I've just got to go and grab my wire. We've got this situation where I've not got my laptop plugged in. So talk amongst yourselves. Garrett, can you come up with some ideas? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big challenge that, Liz. Um, I think we have to <clears throat> think about this um, sort of individually and then see whether or not we can share our, our thinking um, together. Um, one of the one of the things that the Global African Congress uh, continued to promote is the global majority rather than minority. So collectively, um, Africans, Blacks are a global majority. That's the language we use at the Pan African um, movement. So you know, maybe we want to incorporate that uh, interpretation into whatever statement that we want to, to agree on. Yeah, global majority uh, is the thing. Um, but often in any country, um, in the same in, in the UK, um, black people are seen as a minority people and only make up a percentage of the population. In the UK, it's around 10%. Um, and in America, it's a different percentage. So it tend to measure um, black people on the basis of, uh, you know, uh, the minority in that country where they're living. But collectively, if you put all them together, people of African descent, we are a global majority. And that's the language we've been using for the past 10 years or so. Thank you very much indeed. So it could be possible, I think you're quite right, that we need time to think about it individually. Um, and I think it might be interesting, as I say, to look at the United Nations as well, but it would be to acknowledge the global majority people of African heritage. Because that's what we happen to be about and that thing would seem to be appropriate. Anyway, that seems... Uh, Good. Um, so, Michael, um, how's we're coming up to one o'clock now? So, how's about we make a start and you um, share these stories that we're we're all waiting with bated breath to hear about this. This is this is this is really embarrassing. It's never happened to me before, but I've, I've got to say up front, I thought I had an hour. So I've yes, prepared... you have an hour. It, really? It's just okay. always okay, just, okay. so the um, present. I always have something in reserve. Okay, just okay. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the presentation, the, the presentation, and, and some time for a Q and A. Okay, that's great. Okay, yeah, let me see if I can share good. my. Am I, am I allowed? To, can I share my screen? Yes, I can. Let me set it for sound. Optimize for video. Oh, I can't optimize for video clips. That's interesting. But anyway, uh, why can't I optimize for video clips? I'm going to try and help you if there's. Uh, no, no, no. no. The best from the, 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 the it's grayed out for some reason. I don't know. Okay, let's share. Let's share. Let's share. Yeah. Presence can now see your screen. Okay. 
So can you all can you all see that? <laughs> yeah, very clearly, thank you. Well, look, look. Well, th thanks, Liz, for inviting me to uh, share my passion, the John Blank project. Imagine the Black Tudor trumpeter. Well, who was John Blank? John Blank well, he's the first person of African descent. Oh, we believe he's the first person. There may be more out there, but right now he's the only one we really know. He's the first person we, we know. We know we have an image. And a record. There's a there's his there's his name. John Black is spelled there. John B L A K. He's spelled a number of different ways, but John Blake. So we have an image and a record of, and that's what makes it important. The two together, so we know he actually existed, and we know it thanks to th thanks to the fact that we're bringing the art and the archives of England together. Thanks to this man, Sidney Anglo. He was doing work on Henry the Seventh's um, expenses on entertainment. Would you believe, and. He was listing all the money that he'd spent. And this is his, this is his doc. This is where John Black enters, in, enters into that and comes back out of the, in, into modern history. It, 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 it's a record for, of December the 7th, 1507. 1507. There's a line that says, item to John Blank, the black trumpet. And this is where Sidney Angra makes the leap. He says, well, look, I believe that this John Blank was in fact a Negro. This is 1960 now, so the, the text, the, the language is a little different. It is is in the great tournament role at Westminster, Westminster in 1511. So he made the link from a a, 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 a record to a, a, a to an image, and that, that that was published as part of his PhD, say back in the early, the, 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 the early 60s. He was he was he was, he was quite uh, he's quite modest about it because he said he was just doing his you know doing research as uh, as, as students do. But that, that, that really brings John Blank to life. And this is the role he was looking at, the Westminster tournament role. A 60 foot document, around about 16 inches wide, 16 inches wide. And this is really brought out. I've had the pleasure of seeing it because it, it's almost a generational thing when they bring it out. It's held by the College of Arms in London. And it's been there since 1511, over almost half a millennium. And it, it's not, it's, as I say, it's seen very rarely. And I'll explain why later as we go through. As I say, it's 60 foot long. And it was, it, it's, um, it was called by Henry VIII to celebrate the birth of his son on New Year's Day that year to Catherine of Aragon. He had a baby boy, the Duke of Cornwall. And this was a joust that Henry called. And because the birth was so important to him because to have a boy, that means the dynasty was secure. And people could relax a bit now. So, because what was coming next was always a concern to the, if the king dies, what happens to us? So here he has, it's called his dynasty. And that that search for a, an heir really, well, we know all the, the wives and the history of Henry VIII. But here we're seeing he did have a, a son, the Catherine of Aragon. And this, this document, this this joust was called to celebrate that, that um, birth. And it was really Henry, what, what I call Brexit in reverse, there was here's the young Henry. He's, he's about 19 years of age, and he's looking across Europe at the uh, Francis I of France, in the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope. These were the great powers of Europe, and England was was uh, was uh, was at the time seen as a, a warring country on the edge of Europe. But things had changed thanks to his dad and the the the, uh, the 1485 the, the Battle of Bosworth. Where he killed where Richard III was defeated, and Henry VII became king of England, and he united the roses, the um the the, the two warring tribes, or or the the, the rose, the Lancastrians and the uh, Yorkshires, the red and the white rose, and he unified England. And he he was quite an astute man, his father, Henry VII. He he was both, both kind of financially astute. He, he, the, the coffers of England grew. People got people paid taxes and they got things in return. So, and England became not a warring country, but a country wanted to make connections with Europe. And you saw a little bit of that in the in how he brought Catherine of Aragon, Spain, over to to, to marry his son Arthur. I mean, his, his son Arthur died, and there was, there was a big debate whether he should send her back. But he but she came with a dowry. So he didn't want to send the dowry back, so he kept it. It took almost seven years before, in the end, it decided you can marry Henry, the boy, the, the young, the younger son. So that's how Henry became king. The, the the younger son became king, and he was a young, progressive man. And I argue, as I say, this is a, a kind of a Brexit in reverse. He's looking to impress the rest of Europe, and you get, get a sense of this here. This is his father's tomb, 
Henry the Seventh's tomb. And you can see here these cherubs. These are straight out of the Italian Renaissance because the tomb was designed by Torrigiano, Pietro Torrigiano, and he was a contemporary of Michelangelo. So you can see the Italian Renaissance style. And it was not just the Italians, there was French, there was other influences in, in, in the Henry's court because he wanted to be literally big in Europe. And th th as I say, this, this sense of Brexit in reverse, I'm here, look at England, we're England, we're, we're a power to be reckoned with. And this joust was to, was to show that magnificence. And the argument, you know, some people have the argument that go that if this was if this was the Olympic Games, then the opening ceremony would be two weeks. The actual games themselves would be a couple of days, maybe a week, and the closing ceremony would be a week. Because it's not about the games, it's not about the jealousy, it's about the ceremony surrounding it, the, the pomp and circumstance surrounding it. So we can see that see that as I say in the 60-foot document, it records two days. 11th and 12th, 1511, uh, the 11th, 11th and 12th of February, 1511. And it, there's a, the opening ceremony and the, 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 court, the Henry's court parades. There's the actual joust, and then there's the closing ceremony over the two days. But that, 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 that's what it's caught on this uh, document. And in the opening ceremony, here we were introduced to the first image of John Blank as he leads the, uh, the, 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 the court. With trumpets sounding, sounding the uh, sounding that the king. Here comes the king, and we can clearly see John Blank there in the second in the line of, of six trumpeters leading the procession. Then, one of the things I'd like to point out, which I think is really, got, I get really excited. I don't know. I, I, I spent the whole day watching the Queen's funeral. I was just enthralled by the the magnificence and the prestige. But look, in this in the Westminster tournament role, we had the trumpets and the heralds. And those heralds bang, were exactly what the heralds we saw at the proclamation of the, of the, the Charles III. You know, the queen is dead, long live the queen. We've got the trumpets and heralds. This is exactly what we, we're, we're looking at here in this document from 1511. And we look at the queen's funeral, we can see the, 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 the trumpeters on, on horseback, not so many now. I think these are reduced times now for more economic. And there, but there we have the uh, the, the heralds and the, and the pursuivants, and there they are. I know I've met some of these people. These and these some of their titles go back to some go back to fourteen eleven. Titles like York Herald. You know, these are these are people who are uh, intimately connected with the king and the queen because they, they actually the heralds contain the record of the hereditary of the king, so they say, Charles III is the king because we can, they, we the heralds know his past, his history, and, they, and they're there to announce it and present it. So it's great to see John Blank is part of a tradition that's over, over almost, uh, well, it's over a thousand, over half a thousand, over 500 years old. Now, I want to give you a sense of that the, the trumpets were an, an important part of the court. And, and they, as I say, they were announcing, here comes the king, there goes the king, breakfast is served. It was really, a key part of the court, and no court, no um, hall was built without some sort of gallery, some mus musician gallery, as to 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 play to, to the court. And trumpets were an important part of that music. And I'll give you a sense of it here. Let me just pull this back a bit so you can have a listen to what it might have sounded like. Just a second. So, so, so you have a, a, a feel what 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 the sound was like, and this is the central scene of the joust. And this is this is this is a this is a bit of poetic license here. Just a, just a, a few remarks on the actual we're looking at here. This is Henry performing the premier move of jousting. He's doing two things. First, he's knocking his man off, his opponent off his horse, and secondly, he breaks his lance. Oops, let me say he breaks his lance and. He, you know, you don't get better than that. But let me be upfront. This never happened. We've got we've got the records of the jousting from that day, and this is literally, literally you got to big up the king. The the um the artist knew his place and and, and that suitably portrayed put, put, portrayed the king doing this great joust, and the king actually won, although he wasn't the best on the day. But hey, great to be the king. And I'm Henry VIII. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be I'm the winner. No question. Well, just just in passing the oh, we should stop doing that. You can see that this is this is the ladies of the court here, and there's Catherine of Aragon. She's still in bed. 
still in bed because the baby was New Year's Day. This is February the 12th, so six weeks later, six, seven weeks later. And you can remember, childbirth was almost a, was, was a near-death experience for ladies back in the day. So she was still quite poorly. But here she was, pulled out of her bed to, and, and shown, to the, shown to the world as Henry does his thing. He's got a son and he's, he's leading the world. The rest of you are showing who he is. Then the second, this is the most uh, famous appearance of John Blank. We see him here in the closing ceremony and he leads the way. And this is the most requested image in the College of Arms. Yeah, yeah. If we, every time I, I have to, when I, use, I have to pay to use it, people pay to use it. It's a sought after image, it's a celebrated image because they're not funded of enough. So they get their money from, they get their money from, uh, oh, just forgive me, that's my, I'm, I'm on my own here. Just give me one second, sorry for this. I've, I've got, there's someone at the bell, I thought, just one second, please. I'm, I'm expecting some apologies, apologies. I'm coming back, I'm coming. Mute myself. Um, this is fascinating because this image is so well known, um, and uh, and it's a great way. Um, Wilton's uh, will be interested in this too because we've talked in the past about uh, the history of black people in the UK. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, so as I say, the Heralds or the, or the Co College of Arms is important because they 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 contain the the, the history. The hereditary, the lineage of the king and queens of England. So we know this is the queen, but they have to support themselves. So they and they support themselves by if you want a coat of arms, these are the people you come to. They'll they'll make your coat of arms for a price, for a price, but they'll do it for you. So so there we have, there we have this is the closing ceremony. And <clears throat> excuse me, I show this here and we will look at this again. This is a this is this is the young Henry. He's got the broken lance there. That's what the winner gets. You're the main man. And here he's surrounded by all his footmen, his henchmen, and there's much gold in terms of saying, look, I am. His magnificence was on show as he parades before his arm. You can see his queen there. Now, there's those, there we have those two images of John Blank at the opening and closing ceremony. Just a few remarks. The, the opening John Blank is a, is a very deteriorated image. It's not, it's, for some reason, it's not, it's not as well looked after. But having said this, this document was not looked at for three, four hundred years because it wasn't, it's, it's a, the baby had died. So who, who wants to see it? And we believe that yeah, the eagle-eyed of one, you will notice, he's got a white hand here. What's all that about? Well, if we look, let me just go back. If you see, the, if you look at the, the, the other trumpeters, they're essentially it's the same figure and they've just popped a different head on John Blank to say, he was not the same as the rest, but they, they, they've not finished off his hand as, they, as he's done with the, with the other John Blank, with the first John Blank. You can see the first John Blank has a brown hand. And I've got Miranda Calvin to thank for this. And I believe it said they didn't complete this and the quality assurance that would have happened, they would have looked at it, didn't happen. People didn't look at it because the baby was dead by the time this was finished. So nobody wanted to see it. So there we have that white, white hand remaining there is a kind of a testament to the fact that no one was really interested in this document anymore. And so it, it, it was to be put in the cupboard and it took a, I say, almost another 500 years before Sidney Angle got out and looked, to, looked closely at it and see who that John Blank was. Now, that image is really important because John Blank is, is, is one, only one of three people who we can recognize from their face in the, in the tournament role. All the others, we recognize them through their coat of arms or, so, or words are written above them because we don't know the image. John Blank is clearly recognizable. Here's a group of um, earls going into, into the House of Lords and they all look the same, but each is noted by the coat of arms. Another example, this is um, the, the, uh, the, the Knight's Garter, the Knight's going into the court. And this is, this is Henry looking at, looking at his uncle, um, Arthur Plantagenet. And you can see, we know who they are, not by their face, but by their, their wrapped in their flag, wrapped in their coat of arms, because this was this was a time before um, images were known. Okay, another example: this is the deathbed of Henry the Seventh, and again we can see the, these coat of arms. These are these are the great and good of the of of Henry the Seventh's court around him, and we know who they are 
thanks to their coat of arms. Like we look at this, this is the bishop, Bishop of Rochester, Richard Fox, and we know it's that because we can see there's his coat of arms, and there, there's the um, arms of uh, the, the 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 bishop. That's, that's the bishop of Rochester, and that's the fox's arms. The, the, this family coat of arms. So you can see they come together to create the the bishop of uh, Winchester as Richard Fox. That, that's how we know he is. Portraiture didn't arrive until the 1520s, really, with, with Hans Holborn. And he came with, he, he, he took the, he, well, he painted Erasmus, one of the great scholars of the day. And Erasmus knew Sir Thomas More, one of the great English scholars. And he, he recommended Hans, because Hans Holborn was looking for painting, because at the time the Reformation was happening in his hometown, Switzerland, and there was not so many people wanted their picture painting or, or many, much um, religious painting being done. So there was an opportunity for him in England. And he came over here with a recommendation from Erasmus, presented himself to Henry Moore, uh, to, to, to Thomas More, and then literally the rest of history, he created the, the Tudor court as we know it today and this iconic image of Henry that kind of sums up the power of the image to kind of portray the, 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 the magnificence, the majesty of, of the court. And you, you can see that, see, when, when we look at those images from the, the oh, well, on the uh, Westminster Torrent Road, okay, they are caricature, but nevertheless recognizable. And, but they were, they were that, that's why in some ways, John Blank was unique. In fact, I used to say, he's the first working class man we know in English history, but that's not quite true. There's what Tyler, the Peasants' Revolt is a bit earlier. We've got a caricature similar image of him but it just underlines how how special images were, and how this is quite this is this is unique, and at a time because there was no images, the images were not weren't done at the time unless you were, as as, as we see with Holbein, you were an elite, a noble, you were a member of the court, a senior member of Henry, Henry's court. You'd have your you'd have your picture taken or your your your, your picture taken, your picture drawn by a, by an, by an artist, and you given given a name and an image to know. So people, folk would know who you are. So, as I say, we know John, John Blank is unique and uh, uh, first in British history because he has this record here. This is the, the 1507 record that, um, that Sidney Anglo was referring to. And there we can see John Blank, the black trumpet. And it says, item to John Blank, the black trumpet for his month's wages of November last past. And it says, okay, you wrote 8D the day. And it says, you can see, XX as 20 shillings, 20 shillings on 80 the day, 30 days in the month, eight times 30, that's 240, 240 pence in a pound. You know, I'm, some of us of a certain age will, will be nodding there because they recognize the pound, shillings and pence. But And that, that, that wage, a pound, was a, was a fairly good wage, about two or three times what a, 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 a labor would earn. But you have to remember, he didn't, um, he didn't, well, he was all found. So he didn't have to buy his clothes, didn't have to pay for his housing, his food, it was all paid for. After, it was, when they went on, when they went traveling, they had to pay for his, he had to pay for his lodging. But when, when he was in, in town, in one of the king's palaces, it was all free. So he, 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 was, he was well looked after, well looked after in the end, in the lot. So, so there we have the fact that John Blank, the first person of African said, both an image and a record of. So look, these are his, uh, uh, his record of his appearances in the, uh, the, the to the court court record. He was paid wage, as I said, we just showed you the fifteen oh seven document. He played at Henry VII's funeral, Henry VIII's coronation. Both in both cases, he was given cloths, and that's recorded. And he plays at the Westminster Tournament Roll, which we just had a look at. And he petitioned for a wage increase. One of the one of the one, Dominic, one of the trumpeters, had died a couple of months previous, and he said, "Look." I should be, I you know, should I should be paid the same as him, because I've been doing the same work, and, I'm, and I want I want it backdated. So he, he got he got the wage increase, and it was backdated, and it was just it kind of showed two things there. One, the kind of the John Blank, um, had some confidence in himself to get a, to get a scribe to write them because we didn't we don't believe he could write, but we believe he could he obviously he could speak English, and we believe he could speak several languages because musicians were were often multilingual and multi, often multi-instrumental, multi-instrumentalist. So then we have the fact that and Henry 
approved of it. So he must have respected or admired John and thank for, 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 his, for his contribution. So that in essence is what we have with John Blank, those, those brief records, because he, he finally disappears from the, the court record in 1512 when he was on his marriage. Um, we, and Henry gives him a wedding present on his marriage. And then the next listing of trumpeters is 1514, we've not mentioned there. So, so the, the, there we have those brief records, but they're not, they're not, they're not a biography, they're just statements. And this is, this is that, and so many questions can be asked about, where did he come from? You know, where did he go? Who did he marry? Where did he go? Where, where did he go after, after he got married? Why is he wearing a turban? And that name, John Blank, what does that mean? Lots of questions that we don't know from the record doesn't reveal that. And that, that, that's where the project comes in, as, as, Alex, as I shall explain. Because the project is about, well, it started from uh, this, the, the Tower Hill station for me, really. This is, this is the underpass to um, the Tower of London at Tower Hill Station. And under it, it's lined with murals of, of the life and times of Henry the Seventh and of Henry the Eighth, the life of Henry the Eighth. And if you look at the the one of them shows this this um, ornament roll, and the eagle eyed amongst you will recognize that that's the central scene, the now scene for the Westminster tournament roll. And they at the side, you can see here, there's a trumpeter there. He's put John Blank in, the black trumpeter. And that was that's what really caught my imagination that they brought John Black to, John Blank to life. And what's interesting, the, the artist who did this, Stephen Brockley, he wasn't making any statements about blackness and all the, the kind of thing I'm making. He was just from an aesthetic point of view. It looked good. It kind of it, it, it balanced his image out. He had the modernist eyes. You can see from the way he's uh, recreated the image, and he's a very very generous. I said, "Well, look, I asked him if he would do a bit of drawing for me." And I could only afford an A5 drawing. And he said, no, I'll do you an A4, which is twice that size. And he did that, that drawing. And that, 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 that made me think, look, this is the first picture of John Blank in over 500 years. And so, so we have this uh, a, a, really, a really magnificent in, in, um, image. Uh, as I say, uh, very special, very special, not just to me, because that's a person I admire and like, but also it's the first time he's been produced in 500 years. Because my introduction to the black person's in art was, was this was the black figure in this adoration scene. This comes from uh, 16th century Dev Devon, about 1520, right about the same time as the Westminster Tournament Roll. This is in, in Devon. And we've got a black king there. And I studied the black king and, uh, and there are, there are literally, well, this is in the National Gallery. There's at least 12, 13 black kings. Then there's, there's many hundreds, perhaps thousands of black kings from this period across Europe. In fact, it's a really enduring image because if you look at my, 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 my the black king I studied from around 1520, but it's still with it today. I brought, this is a, a black magus I brought in Germany. Anyone who's been to a German market, We'll see the nativity scene, and you have the three kings, and one of them will be black. Because this is a very enduring image, particularly in Germany, but across throughout Europe. And in fact, we're still celebrating the the, the, the day of the three kings, sixth of January, and one of them is black. So he was well known, but there was only these two images of John Blank. So I said, "Well, look, well maybe I could, I should do something about that. Maybe I could spread, you know, get something going in terms of." Taking that from little we know and getting out, getting artists to say to 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 reimagine John Blank, but at the same time I said, well, look, if we're going to do it from a, a visual point of view, we've also got to uh, uh, and forgive the joke, we've got to fill in the blanks in terms of his history, who he was. So this is where I got artists to um to, to I'm not sorry historians to come up with three hundred words about some aspect of his life. And for instance, it was Jan Marsh, there she is, Jan. She was the one who pointed out to me the, the special, special nature of that image in comparison to in, 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 in Tudor times. In Tudor times. So the, the art, the, the historians all make a statement about 300 words. And I, I commissioned them. Everybody gets paid. Not a lot, not a lot, but everyone gets paid. Because I try to respect everybody's work. I don't, I don't want think things for nothing. Having said that, some people do it for nothing, but then I put that back into the project and bring other people in, into the project. And there's about, th th there's, there's, there's almost 30 historians now. And there's, this is uh, Olivetti Hotel. She talks about Afro-European. Well, Professor Hakimadi talks about an agent of change. Robin Walker talking about a black man with a trumpet changing perceptions. 
Um, or Miranda Kaufman, she she found over 360 Africans. She talks about John Blank in relation to other Africans in Europe. And, and I talked there about Jan Marsh and portraiture. She she pointed out the, how special his painting was. And this is a Phil Day, he did a, a rap. And he said he showed how John Blank was illustrated an expansion of uh, of of, uh, of of Britain in into Europe. The art the, the artist I, I treated a little bit differently. I, I I commissioned them, got a work for them. I wanted to do the work A4 black and white. That was the original. But then more and more artists want someone some poets wanted to do some work, some rappers, photographers, playwrights. So the artist has expanded to to many different media. But none of the artist work is online. I get the artist to make a statement. I, I imagine John Blank as. I imagine John Blank. And they make a statement. Oh, what was in their mind as, as, as they were doing their work? So I'll, I'll give you some examples here. This is uh, Phoebe Boswell. She imagined him, John Blank as uh, Shibank Hutch, Hutch, and he's a, a trumpet, a, 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 a saxophone player, a, trump, a saxophone, saxophonist. Um, uh, another, this is one of my favorites. This is um, John Daniels. He imagined John Blank as a trump card. The late John Daniels, sadly he's passed away now. Great man, very, very creative, very creative man. Or we have um, uh, Kofi, the Kofi artist. He was the runner up, one of the in, runner up in the Portrait Artist of the Year. And he imagined John Blank as a learned man, the great awareness of the world. Or uh, Lynette Kamala, she used uh, calligraphy to kind of reflect who John Blank was or who he was, how he should, how she saw him. As I say, today there's about 60 artists, 30 um, historians who made contributions to the project. So you gotta ask, well, why, 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 why now? What's so special now? Well, I think it's really important for me. It's become important now because we live at a time when people want easy answers to quite complex questions, you know? And it, it, it's all these people simply, I know it's, 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 it's a cartoon, but you, you can say the sense that some people can't handle complexity. They can't handle nuance. They can't handle kind of subtlety. It has to be black or white. And, it, and as we all know, it, it's, it's, history is not that simple. I love Obama's word. Obama talks about it's messy. It's messy. It's complex. It's all not together. So Because so, I grew up in a world when there were no black cowboys. When I saw the black cowboy in blazing saddles, I thought they were taking a joke, making, they were mocking him. But when, when you do when you do the research, you find that up to 25 to 30 percent of the cowboys were black. But because no one made movies at the time, I was coming up you, about black cowboys. You didn't believe any black cowboys. So a lot of people don't believe any black Tudors because they haven't seen them. They haven't seen them. So there's, there was this, um, this the director of this of as Elizabeth. He was on the radio a couple of years ago. This is one of the inspirations for the project for me. He, and he, they were talking about how the media changes history. You know, anyone who's seen Braveheart and the history of Scotland, they, it's not quite like, like that. It, 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 it's fantasy, but it's a, it's a fantasy. But media does change history, but and it's both ways in terms, of, well, in terms of positive and negative. And it was said here, the, one of the, the, the director of this, um, Elizabeth said, a black presence in Tudor England would have been inaccurate and inauthentic. Inaccurate, inauthentic, because in his head, it, it, it wouldn't be right. It would be, you know, it would be, you know, you were making, making fun, mockery, be, be gratuitous. But in fact, we know they were there. And the problem is, because people have never seen them there, in the image, well, they're, they're not there. And it was for me that that, 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 that was a deceit because I know, as, you know, as we can see, there were black Tudors, not just John Blanton. And people were quite perplexed when I, I, I took over um, Hampton Court's Twitter account for the day to talk, tell the story of John Blank. And the couple of, there was a couple of tweets that came up that says, I don't believe one word of this. We all know there's an agenda behind this bullshit. Or this one, black his, British history is white history. And I love this. This is a great one. Millions are spent each year in order to manufacture the idea that we're black people in the in royal courts of Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, can get to the sixth, Elizabeth the First. You know, millions. I'd love, I'd love a bit of that. I'd love some of those millions. This is complete nonsense. But th 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 those accounts, when you go back to look at them, the the accounts suspended, the disappeared. These these people, they don't last with their views. But these are the people knocking us because. In their head, they cannot imagine 
a black Tudor. And this, this for me is what the, the, gives me fun, the driving force for me to keep this project going in terms of what we do with it, in terms of we're giving it some life. Like talk about three things, art, archives and action. So there's the kind of three things I'm, I'm, I work on. We look at uh, symposia. I go into, I've done symposia. Um, this is John Blank days where we're, the artists and the historians come together to celebrate John Blank. You know, every, it's like an open mic session for John Blank. People spit who he is in 10 minutes or so in terms of art, in terms of the literature. Then we do workshops. The workshops that go into schools, prisons, and we get people to, to draw their own John, John Blank or write about John Blank. And, uh, and then we have, a, we have a session afterwards and they present the work. And finally, we just had an exhibition of the work at the Walker Art Gallery in, uh, in, in Liverpool. Liverpool. So in terms of the art and archives, in terms of where we are with the project, the project is ongoing. Um, we look where we are today. This is, we've just got a, a plaque, we've got a, a plaque at, um, in Trinity Laban College at, 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 at uh, Greenwich. And the work goes on, the work goes on. The work goes on. Here we've got, um, we've got um, uh, Sean Cunningham. This is really interesting because what, what, what the product has inspired people to go to look back into the records to find out more about John Blank. And what, what he's found a 1488 John Blank an earlier John Blank. And so he raises the question, could the 1488 John Blank be the 1507 trumpeter John Blank? And it's, it, it is raised, raised, raised a big, for me, it was quite a, 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 a stark question in the sense that this is not quite what I expected. Because you, once you've got a view on history, you, you, like, you like that view to be reinforced. But when you get this kind of left field 48, 1488 footman, doesn't fit in your, your, your model. But then you have to think, well, look, this is history in action. It's, it's, it's essentially, it's, it's a work in progress in the sense that uh, it's never static. It's what we know at the time. It's, it's the way we're looking at the time and we look differently. And then what I'm doing is you know, differently, differently, so I should, I should be open to it. So, so far, we, it, it, um, Sean's written about this and we're still trying to understand how you can move from um, footman to to um, to uh, trumpeter, or, or it could be they were different people because the name John Blank was used by across Europe and uh, for um, we believe people who were black. It's a bit a bit like uh, a nickname, like you know, Little John. It, it plays on the fact that he was Little John was big, so John Blank was was white. Or blank is as French for whites. So maybe because he was black, they were, they were, they were playing on his words. We, we, because there were, as I say, there were, there were other John Blanks. Also, we've done some other, some really exciting, this for me, I find really exciting in the sense that it's bringing the documents to life. Because I remember I talked about the fact that Henry VIII gave him a wedding present, gave him a wedding present. Well, we've actually just found, for want of a better word, the tailor's bill. This document here, the document you can see on the screen there, this document lists the material that was put, the material that was bought and then put together to create that doc, that, 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 that beautiful gown you see there. And what, what's, what's so wonderful about it from, from my point of view, it's purple, purple. Now, you know, I, purple is a black color, but black, black people look great in purple. So he must have looked really quite magnificent. And we, we've got, uh, the folk at uh, Tudor Taylor, Nina McCallier, she looked at that and she recognized it instantly when she, she could, because she'd seen this, this kind of uh, instructions before. So, so there we have the, the, um, the John Blank in his wedding dress, and it would have been that beautiful purple gown. I'm tempted to see if I can get one made for myself, but um, one, of the, the, one of the problems, where, where do I get, get 50 beaver hairs? In this day and age, but we shall say no. But so this all just just underlines that it's it's still a work in progress. We continue doing the work and in China studying John Blank. The, he's not he's not um, it's not finished yet. And if, if you want to know more, if you want to keep up to date, then if you check out who is John Blank on any social media, you'll find that, that that's that's the post I use to. Um, to uh, that, that, those are the sites where I, where I post these this news, ongoing news about John Blank, 
And only, only like this week, we've just found another John Blank. And I haven't got all the pictures here. I'm sorry, I can't show you, but they found, this is a picture of John Blank from a, from a battle in 1512. And the, 1512. Now you, can, you remember he disappeared from the record of 1511. So there's a 1512 John Blank at the, the Battle of Spurs. Now it doesn't say it's John Blank, but it's a black trumpeter in Henry's court. So we believe it could well be him. We don't know. Obviously we're looking for more information, but it's all part of the, the ongoing, the ongoing um, uh, excitement that, 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 that the project inspires other people to actually get involved and find out more about the, the man John Blank. And let me bring you right up to date. There's really exciting times now. I've told you we've got the exhibition at, um, at Tate Britain at, at, at the Walker Art Gallery. We've just done, we've just done some recording last year at the National, National Archive. Um, I had the pleasure of, I was invited to the Met to present and the that you can set a video online. And I've just, we just, it's going to go online. John Blank's going to be part of the new hang at the National Portrait Gallery when it opens in June. And I've been, I've been filming with um, Sky Arts to do a session for him. So John Blank is very much really alive and well in terms of part of Black British history, but more importantly, just part of British history. Just in the same way we saw that those trumpets and heralds from back in the day are still with us today. And one of them happened to be Black, showing that Black people were part of British history from way back when. It's uh, and, and I even go as far as to say, They've always been around the seat, in and around the seat of power, because you you can look at the there was black people at the courts of Henry the of um, uh, Elizabeth the first, George the fourth had, had, had black people in his court and that performed for him. And we move forward in, into uh, to Victorian times. You know, Queen Victoria had uh, Sarah Falls Bonetta. So the black people have always been in and around the seat of power, for for for. for, for for decades, for centuries, for centuries. And I want to finish on this. This is um, the book, the book, my, the book, the John Blank Project, Artists and Historians Reimagined, the Black Tudor Trumpeter. And this is where I'll bring all the, um, the paintings, uh, the, the, the drawings and the writings together in one book. Along with, I've, 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 there's some, there'll be some editorial work. I'm going to get some, some, uh, some celebrity to do the introduction. So it's going to be a, a book. And this book is going to be crowdsourced, crowdsourced. Because as I say, all up, up until now, I've funded this all from myself. And also, but I've also been given, whenever I speak, I put the money back in and I'm paid to speak. And I've been, a number of, number of institutions have been, been kind enough to, 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 to pay, pay me. So when I put that back into the project, so I want to uh, now, the book, I'm going to have crowdsourced. So you, in a couple of, in a month or two's time, you'll, you'll be, you'll be, you get an email from me or you'll see a tweet from me or something on social media that'll kind of jog your memory that maybe if you make a contribution or maybe spread the word. So look, on that note, I, I, I want to finish the, um, the John Blank Project, introducing, <laughs> introducing to what the product's all about. And I'd be, be happy to take any of your questions. Well, that's been absolutely amazing um, that you, you've really almost brought him back to life, haven't you, as a character who we can all talk about, we can know about, we can, we can share his story. Just absolutely amazing. Well, thank you. For, th thank you. Thank you for that, Liz. And, and, and that's all part of the project to kind of normalise him. But there's, yeah. there's, there's, oh, whoops, I'm trying to, I'm trying to close this and it doesn't want to let me. Why is it not letting me? This is, I've lost control of my. Gareth, has a question or a point that you want to make. Okay, I'm, oh, that's it, I'm back then. No, that's, and actually for this, it, 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 it's quite difficult. Let me explain why it's difficult for me. On the one hand, I want, I want him to be normalized, that they would accept it. And I want to fight against what I call essentialism. Like, wow, a black man there. The fact that it's not, he wasn't the only one. There was, there's Miranda's document at least, uh, Miranda Kaufman documented at least 300 or so. And there were, there may be up to a thousand in England at the time. We were there. So you, we, we don't celebrate him, him, him as being peculiar, particular, something different. We said we celebrate because he was part of something you part of something great because i think this kind of essentialization this celebrity status yeah, i think it's too much i really want them to be thought as part of just 
the normalization of the black presence in Tudor times. Well, that's the vision. The reality, as you say, is, is, is not is, is a bit more difficult to actually execute. Okay, let's see what Garrick wanted to contribute. Um, Michael, I, I, I can feel your passion, you know, on this subject, you know, it's just enthusiastic, you know, it's, it's there, it's very infectious, and, and it, it's great. Um, you made a, a couple of points, which I think is really what Black History Conversation is all about, because you referred to, um, you know, being part of British history in your final comments, etc. And yes, that is the case, you know, we this group are trying you know, desperately to increase the conversation across British history and not just saying, you know, this is a black history conversation. It needs to be much wider than a black history conversation. And the example that you've just given us back in the 1500 demonstrate that, um, you know, that was just part of, of, of British, British history and British culture. Uh, the thing for me is about, you know, this information getting into mainstream. And, you know, when I say mainstream, I'm referring to um, schools, uh, further education, higher education, uh, social science, you know, a whole range of uh, different conversation need to take place. And I think, you know, um, this project is certainly a project that that can achieve some of that um, in terms of you know um, having these conversation in different places, um, and I think we should continue to, to push that. These conversation need to be in different places uh, and to make it a much bigger conversation than just focusing on you know locality or just black history. And I've said this before, when we talk about black history, we get a very narrow audience of interest. Um, and this is to do with the, the, the institutional system in which we, we live on there. But when we embrace, you know, uh, British global African history, the conversation is much bigger, it's global. Thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant. And uh, McCarpy, um, you've got uh, a point to make. McCarpy, I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Yes, 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 Liz. I am here. I'm just um, trying to work yeah. out the difference of using my phone and being on the laptop. Um, absolutely fantastic um, presentation. You, the, the passion, the enthusiasm. Um, for the for the project uh, came through. It's educational. I can see. I can see in schools. I mean, if we had that in our day or in my youth and school, and that being presented, it the impact that it would have, or it would have on you know a youth, seven year old, eight year old, whatever age. You know what I mean? In school, I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's phenomenal. It was good to see my teacher, Robin Walker. And um, what you stated about the exceptionalism, it was a bit like when I was uh, in my younger days, I saw a documentary on James Baldwin. You know what I mean? It was a matter, it was a matter of a, what, you've got black writers. You understand what I'm saying? It was like, mm. huh? Yeah. you got a black man who writes books you know what I mean it's like kind of mind-blowing at that so, mm. so I could write I, do you understand what I'm saying so it's, yeah, that, yeah. it's that kind of effect that it would have on well anyway I mean I did buy a book called Black Tudors I think he was on the cover if I remember right I'm not sure but I never actually read it but yeah fantastic work um, oh, lovely, lovely. That, 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 that's, that's Miranda Kaufman. We, we work very closely together, Miranda. And yeah, that is John Blank on the cover of uh, the Black right. Tudors. The yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd, I'd, uh, um, I know I must probably leave my email. And uh, if you could email me, I'd uh, like to write something or do something about John Blank. 
Okay, yeah, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Do, do, drop me a line. If you, if, if you, you've got my email. You, you've, do people see my email in the list? I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just. I'll, I'll, is it in the chat? I'll, I'll put it in the chat now. I will put it right. Okay, now. put it in the chat then. Yeah, no, no, yeah. No. I'll take it down, man. Okay. Fantastic work. Well, love it. Well, thank you, thank you. Dude. And that's yeah, the that's joy me. of Black History Conversation. Right, so it's Michael at O H A J U R U dot com. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Roxanne, you've got something to contribute. Okay, um, yeah, just a few quick things. Um, I think I, I've been lucky enough, privileged enough to see Michael actually in person. Um, and yes, the enthusiasm comes through. And he mentioned some of the, what was it, tweets or responses, you know, there weren't black people, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's something that one of my children actually said to me in connection with something else. And it's a picture paints a thousand words, mm. you know? yeah. and by having um, a picture as well, it's evidence. No matter how much people talk about something, saying, "Well, where's the evidence?" You know, historically, well, where's your evidence coming from? What source are you using? Um, that's that aside. From an educational point of view, I was hoping that she would have been able to join us. Audrey, um, uh, why is her name gone? Mary Seacorn. She's not Mary Seacorn. Um, Audrey, Audrey, if you're there, make yourself known. You might be one of the other David Gleaves. Audrey. Eugene. Yes. Thank you, David. Yes. I, Audrey very kindly supported me when we put together a presentation of using um, paintings and some of the um, adoration paintings where there actually was the Black King. And we presented this to educators. Now, there weren't as many educators there online, but since then people have started sort of saying to me, oh, you know what you did almost two years ago? And I'm thinking, it, unfortunately, it will take a long time for the penny to start to drop that <laughs> we were there. The evidence, the evidence are in the hieroglyphics in Egypt. The evidence are all over the place. But if you're not opening your eyes and looking, then you're not going to see it. And in my maturity, I'm opening my eyes more to see a reflection of myself and I'm seeing it. And as you know, Liz, when we were on holiday, we walked around and we found it. Yeah. That's it. It's remarkable. Thank you so much, Oxan. That's great. Michael, did you want to come back on that? <laughs> well, the deep breath, you know, things have moved on now. Things have moved on. I think the Black Tudors are part of the curriculum now in the sense that uh, immigration is part of the history column. It's part of history books. It's, it's open, there's, do, there's documentation of history yeah, for history teachers to access. And it's, it's, it's well known and it's becoming increasingly well known. So I, I, I'm, I'm confident now that the work we're doing is really bringing it in, but it's part of a bigger initiative, a bigger initiative, because it's looking at history with different eyes, not just of, and no disrespect to white males, but you know, there's more to history than just the success and, 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 and ambition of white males. There's, there's women, there's the, the, the progress of women. There's also disability, Dis, disability, the, the, the history of disabled people, where are they? You know, and so, and black people's part of that, looking back with a different eye. Let me just tell a little bit about disability and how sensitive it is. Leicester University did some work on the, 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 the talk about the, the, um, the end of Henry VIII's life, and he couldn't, he was so fat, he had to be wheeled round in a, a wheelchair. He was, in effect, disabled. And, and some historians were distressed that they were being politically correct, talking about a disabled Henry VIII, because that's not, the, that's not the, the model we have of Henry. You know, he's that big man, you know, standing forthright on that, that Turkish rug there. 
you know, we've got this view of history that's kind of, that's it. And what we do now with figures like John Blank or disabled people, we challenge the narrative that it's, you know, come out of the bombs. It, it's complex, it's messy, and, um, but we're all in there or different versions of us. And it's good to, as my mum would say, it's good to see your face. It's good to see your face. And that's being more acceptable today. It's more accepted and being open, not just black faces, as I say, disabled women, make, making it much more, much more interesting. Sorry. I went on a bit then. Sorry. Thank you. That, no, that's, that's brilliant. Because it, it's about reflection, this. It's about conversation. So June Elizabeth is going to join in now. Yeah, good afternoon. Well, thank you very, 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 very much, Michael. And um, I, I think when I went to Birmingham University, they had a Black History um, event, and I just saw it the last minute. I, th I think um, Sean invited me, and you were there, and that's where I bought my book from Miranda, and she signed it. She didn't put the date. You, I'm sure you were there. I've seen you a couple of times. Yeah, um, and then um, I feel that period of history, I love it. And this gentleman that you presented is one of my favourite people to listen to. So I thank you very, very much. And um, I, I noticed that Gary put something in the chat about CLR James, the black Jacobons. <laughs> yes. So I'm just showing that my library is full of full of um black history. So thank you very much. That was excellent. Excellent. I've seen you before present. So you carry on. Lovely. And I should be supporting in any way that I can. Thank One you. Love. That, thank you so love. much. Thank you. Thank you, June. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Well, that's, that was just brilliant, wasn't it? And 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 what's really interesting, I, I feel as if I I've come to really try and study Black history, I suppose, through these conversations. I've had the luxury of hearing so many people um, jo who joined us and and shared and told the different stories. And I feel it's a bit like trying to put a jigsaw together. And Miranda Kaufman was uh, in touch with me at one stage because she'd been she's from North Wales, and um, I know she'd been over in in Jamaica recently. But it's really good when you hear you talk about one another. And my big luxury in life here is that I buy the BBC History magazine to check that there's something about Black history in it every month. And uh, yeah, have, have you had an article in there yet? The long answer is no, no, but I know what you mean. Yeah, that, that, that is an excellent publication. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at getting things published, which you do same, but I've got a couple of things written, but I've not done um, any for Black Brit, for, um, for the BBC. But John Blank, there's a, lot, there's a lot of me, Miranda, and the Black Tudors, you know, if you go online, there's, there's a lot going on. It's just fabulous the fact that people are open like groups like yourself are open to uh, finding out more about him. And what, what what's what's fascinating is you know someone's posted um, the black Jacobeans there, and that that's great. I mean, you want you want to look at the connections. What's the connection between John Blank and the black Jacobeans? We well, got to ask yourself. Well, hang on a sec. You know, those are revolutionaries. So was John Blank a revolution? No, he wasn't. You know? But if you look at black later. As as more as England connected with uh, with Africa, and England got very connected. Then you do see revolutionaries, you see abolitionists in Africa, and you can make a connection from 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 blacks in in um, in Elizabeth, probably Elizabethan, probably uh, Stuart times into uh, the Jacobeans there. And for me, that's something I'm really passionate about: the connections, that black connection from one group of black people to another. And how they interacted with the white people, with Britain. So you get that Black British history, that connection. And slavery is a key part of it, but there's other parts. You know, the Chartist movement. You know, the, the right to get votes or women's votes. Those Black people were involved with white people to actually achieve that. You know, the working class, the working class connection. So and and, and, how, and how that moved into Pan Africanism, and how the decolonization, and that and, and that moved into. Um, the race riots of the 50s, and then we get the wind of how it's all interconnected. 
It's not in its own right. And that's something I'm really passionate about, looking for the connections then with now. So there's kind of a, a stream of, of consciousness. And I'll give you, I'll finish on one example. Uh, something like um, uh, Amy, um, Amy Garvey, his first wife, you know, she, she was involved in Pan, she was involved in the Pan-African movement, but also she helped, she was involved in getting the women the vote. She was also involved with decolonization in, in, in Africa, the African movement with, with uh, the West Indian, with the Nigerian Students Union and other. And she was also involved in the um, Notting Hill Carnival. So that was a woman, a black woman, just with, with a long history of activism. And it's that connection of those, of those, of black history intimating with, 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 with British history, for me, really, really turns me on. Not just Amy Garvey as an individual, but the things that she created around her, which endure to this day. Fantastic. I'm going to ask Wilton. Wilton's doing um, some work which um, I'm not, I, I find a bit difficult to get my head around. Wilton, are you online at the moment? <laughs> Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Well, so I wonder if you just want to briefly um, describe the work you're doing about the um, about the history of black people in Britain. <clears throat> yes, uh, yes. Thanks. Liz. I mean, I'm, I'm approaching it from many angles, you know, source materials, which is really hard to find because a lot of the original sources there are many um, writers and historians. My favorite one is Tacitus in, in Rome, ancient Rome. He described these African pygmy uh, picks, the Pictish people. And then people will say, no, they were tattooed. They were not African. But I have other sources as well. So what I'm trying to do is lay the foundation for scientific work, which is Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson. And he wrote his book, Traced. Uh, Miranda Kaufman at Oxford, you know, I did postdoc studies myself at Oxford, but she wrote about the black tutors. And I was saying Oxford is a thousand years old. What has taken them so long to figure out that there were blacks in the UK? But her book on black tutors uh, makes a footprint, but not a big enough sort of footprint. Um, you need to go further than that. And other writers like Dr. John Johnson in the States, he passed away four years ago. He wrote about the Negro rulers of Scotland and the British Isles. And a hundred years ago, David MacRitchie, he wrote uh, several volumes on the ancient Britons. So there are sources, even, you know, describing uh, persons as uh, Huguenots, um, uh, President Washington in the States. And there's, of course, that special relationship between the UK and the US because of colonization, I mean, we, we know, but it's the real history. When anyone's talking about black history, I said it before, we need to repackage it as global history because that's what it is. The science will tell of genetic mutations, the Y chromosome, which tends to be avoided. The scientific papers tend to focus on the maternal side, the mtDNA. And I don't, look, that's, that's their business, but it's not accurate. If you find a male sample that is quite old, then you just need to do a, a big Y because men possess the Y chromosome. So from a scientific standpoint, I'm convinced. I'm a haplo E, and E is supposed to be like the oldest, so what the like the oldest haplo group. It doesn't go in alphabetical sequence. It doesn't start from A. <clears throat> it's from E, and then A is a branch just offshoot from from E. And uh, you have, you know, groupings like, you know, Jeanson has mapped it out. He, he has done his trials. He's Harvard, you know, qualified PhD level microbiologist. Some people want to demonize his work and say it's a pseudoscience. But I said to myself, everything could be characterized as pseudoscience. If you attribute the first particle to a higher power, higher being, then you are going to incorporate some belief system in that science. I mean, I guess the work of CERN and those in Switzerland that's trying to chase their tails to come up with black matter or whatever they're researching would love to objectively find the origins of life if they can use this machine to help them. But so far they haven't done anything. And so we are left with the mystery, how did the first particle or the cell which divided and divided again 
and divide it again. How and who and where did it come from? So uh, I get hit sometimes with the pseudoscience point, but okay, if you go- so we're, we're, um, And I know you can tell us a whole lot more about this, but I'm just gonna pause you at that moment, just to see if Michael wanted to come back on any points that you've made there. Yes, you, you can speak. <laughs> Dr. MacDonald, I, 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 you know, I, I stay in my lane. I'm obviously because my, my my passion is the black presence in the nation, sure, specifically, and how that I kind of move up, move around that, and in, 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 drift into the nine, the 17th and 18th century. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to comment on some of the things you've talked about because it's not my, it's, and it's, it's, it's I don't, it sounds like a cop out, but it's not my period. In terms of you, you've got a much obviously a much bigger vision of the black presence than I am. I'm just and, gonna and, and just to be clear, what is your what exactly what's your period? I'd say the Renaissance, the Renaissance specifically, the Renaissance. I mean, if you talk about when did the Renaissance start, depends who you're talking. If you're talking about Italy, probably about the 14th century, England a little later, but about the 14th to the 16th century. That, that's my real passion. I have an interest in in times later, in the 18th, particularly as I talked about this. Um, I look at this um, the black thinking, black ideas, abolitionism, pan-Africanism, colonialism, um, the right to vote, women's rights. Those are things I'm interested in as we move into today, that, that, that kind of black thought going forward. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know what, I, I am active in this space and I have a, a wider view. And even in yeah. that period, the Renaissance period, where it's like man's thinking, you know, you saw the Michelangelo's and the Da Vinci and these people, the Mozarts and the musicians, they just like their brains came alive. And it's all inspired as great stuff. And we came up with the motor and the last 100 years, 150 years has been really meteoric, that kind of exponential growth in science and technology. I mean, it surpasses any er era known to man. But I don't want to go into sort of that, you know, I, I don't need to go into that, you know, existential. And I'm trying to keep it real and grounded. And yes, dealing with a wider time frame. And my timeline is not all that big. If, if I look at Judeo-Christian thinking, it's 6,000 years roughly to Adam, accounting for calendar changes. Yeah. But looking at the last 500 years... Yeah. Hang on a minute, because I know you can you can take up the rest of our session telling us about all the different things. So it's just that I'm always looking for some others who will link into what you're talking about, so that um, that we can progress a, a clearer understanding. Because it's just absolutely fascinating what you're saying. But uh, let me just ask now if that's all right, Wilton. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to ask McCarthy to come in, and then I think June Elizabeth have got another point. McCarthy. Yeah. Um. Just on the point that was raised about um Amy Ashwood Garvey. Um and the many things that she did. Um, we did her, well, in a book I saw that she actually stayed in uh, Linwood Road, Answorth at some time. I think in the 19, I can't remember when, what time period, but she stayed in Linwood Road, Answorth. And she was campaigning at that time for, um, in the area of black education, if I remember right. Um, yeah, but that's just a little tidbit. Linwood well, Road, answer. But you, you be, you're on the money there, because she was a, a great woman. In fact, in, in all parts of, of the, the black experience in, in terms of education, in terms of for votes, women's votes, a truly remarkable woman. You know, the more I find out, the more I'm intrigued. Like she, she, went to, she was at a restaurant, and CLR James and Claudia Jones would used to go to a restaurant, you know, so just extraordinary woman. Extraordinary. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, Wilton's put his details in the chat and also Apple Bagger, do you want to explain what this uh, video is about? This YouTube um, that you've just put in the chat? Yes. Could you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, it's a uh, historical timeline 
because uh, as you as you know, or most of you may know, that uh, Wales made mandatory the teaching of Black, Asian, minority, ethnic history in the curriculum from September. And I'm doing a lot of work consultate, uh, consulting with the Welsh Assembly Government, um, looking to drive, you know, different types of curriculum in all the areas of learning experience. So we're not just looking at Black and African history, Asian history, just in humanities. We're looking at it in science and technology, mathematics as well, as well as uh, expressive arts, you know, uh, as well as health and well-being. So what I put in there is a promotional video that I made through my company. It's a historical timeline, which is 8,000 years old. And it puts things into perspective. So when pupils and students see that, so, you know, it was created by a friend of mine and it's something which I'm selling now uh, to schools. And the schools are finding it very useful, even the pupils, because they're actually seeing that black history doesn't start in the latter part of the, um, the modern era from the 1500s. It actually goes back to ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, you know, 8,000 years plus, you know? So there's a perspective and it looks at the Greco-Roman period which came much later. So it actually gives a concept that philosophy, science, technology, mathematics were already established in Central Africa and East Africa before it went to ancient Egypt and then it blew in ancient Egypt and then it diffused into other areas and then this is how uh, things were influenced by the Greco-Romans and you know other high cultural civilizations that came much later so it's a visual reference really and it's a it's like a poster it's in a timeline it's very very long um, there, there are ones which are much longer, looking at longer periods, but there's a good perspective, you know, little bits of writing, a lot of images, looking at timelines, when certain events happened, and who contributed to those particular events, even though Hollywood and the media seem to have whitewashed a lot of the historical images of the African contribution, whether it was the Moors, or whether it was the ancient uh, Nubians, or the ancient Sumerians who were Daskian people. And this is what this timeline does. I've actually, I've opened it and I could show a little bit of that if you were in agreement for that. Yes, yeah, you show, show that if you like, uh, Liz, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to um, welcome Ella, though, because Ella, you joined us part way through. Ella, do you want to tell us where you're from? I'm um, from Lon London, South London, in Balham. Lovely. Um, that's it. That's it. And um, I really, really enjoyed the lecture. I know a little bit about John Black, but it was just a pleasure to just hear it. Ah, just like my toes are tingling. It was just really, really great. Thank you very much. Okay, well, welcome, Ella. I, I, I can't remember so many people have joined us over the, the time um, uh, who's who's uh, who's joined and who hasn't, but you're very, very welcome. Right, Abu Vaga, I am now going to try to show this. Okay. Um, right, off we go then. Well, I found this timeline created with educators and parents in mind and supports several of our ACAPCOM University courses. The ACAPCOM University Academy was founded after decades in conversation with educators and institutes, from schools to museums, staff to members of parliament. All fell short of our expectations as parents and educators ourselves. We began the Academy by offering Black and African history courses in community organisations expanding to accommodate schools, colleges, universities, and now the mandatory Welsh curriculum. As well as institutions, we deliver courses for teachers, trainers, mentors, and parents. In doing so, we found the need to create our own high quality teaching aids to facilitate learning. We created the lineage timeline to serve a few purposes. One, capture neglected parts of history. Two, put related events all on a single timeline. Three, provide us a visual reference. The lineage timeline is the result of our cumulative experience. Our timeline supports black and African history courses amongst others, providing a visual, oral and kinesthetic aid to learning at all levels. History is a map which tells people where they have been and where they must go. 
history is a clock on which people tell their cultural, political, and socioeconomic time of day. John Henry Clark. Wow, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for letting us do this. timeline. Oh, Daisy. Um, right, thank you very much. Thanks for thank sharing you. that, Liz. Um, we'll just maybe take some points from people to you in a moment, but I hadn't formally thanked Michael so very, very much. That was absolutely brilliant. And your enthusiasm shines through. And my only other um, my points I wanted to ask you about is you have a role at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. You're a, a senior fellow. What does what does that involve? I can't hear you. Just sort your mute out. Well, there were two things. Really, they, they helped me start this my, my research into John Blank. They're really instrumental in, in that. But the really big thing I do with them is what's happening in Black British history. This is uh, a series of workshops aimed at really um, early years um, uh, professionals, PhD students, and also community historians to talk about the Black experience, the Black British experience. Um, we've been on for about seven years now. It's been a, we, we're just reorganizing because the black, the um, we've got a new director now at, at the Commonwealth Institute of Commonwealth Studies, so it, it may change. But that those are things I principally did with them. One, they helped me establish the, this project back well, sort of like almost like seven years ago. And then, as I say, if you look at black, what's happening in Black British history, or if you just Google Black British history, you know dot com dot dot co uk, you'll see the uh, what we do. We, we have. Um, as I say, it's always young people. There's some great young people who come through our uh, our uh, through our workshops. Fantastic! Thank you very much indeed for explaining that, and that gives us more things to to follow up. Thank you, Michael. That was no, just thank you. This this has been really interesting. I, I was I was going to make a big statement here. This is the first time I've presented to a group where there's been almost as the same number of men as women. Because traditionally, I'm, I'm used to talking to groups of 90% women, 99% women. So a, a big, deep respect to all the men on the line tonight. That, uh, it, it's really good to see so many men or talk to so many men. It's a, it's a, it's a real experience for me. So thank you. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Apavaga, uh, that um, uh, introductory um uh short for your um your work and, and the activities you're doing in wales now i don't know do you want to say a little bit more about it and then i don't know if there's anybody who wants to comment yeah it's just the fact is that wales have taken the initiative in order to establish um you know black asian minority ethnic uh, studies within the new curriculum from the ages of three to 16. And I'm glad I've been a part of that. Even you know yourself, Liz, you know, you know, many years ago that we, we set up a group together in order to try to convince the Welsh government to make mandatory um, the, um, you know, Black and African history in the curriculum. And we also have a picture of it, which was taken outside the Senate at that time, you know. So it has been a long fight, you know, um, trying to get Black history into the curriculum. It has been something that the Caribbean community has been fighting for since their arrival in 1948. You know, when they were sending their kids to school, they started to realise that it was very much a colonial education, which was being received by white private schools or independent schools back in the Caribbean for the uh, descendants of the uh, colonial masters. So um, what I'd like to say is that I'm glad that I'm in, at, the, at the forefront of trying to develop, you know, authentic modules for schools, college, as well as universities in order to establish uh, Black history. There are four different um, what you call it now, um, examination bodies now, which are gonna have, um, this is college, university, school level, uh, secondary school level, and sixth form, where there's gonna be black and African history qualifications yeah, at the end of this year, there's four examination bodies and I'm most glad to write some of those modules and courses and to bring them forward. You know, looking at things like citizenship, 
because um, a lot of people, which they say if they're English and Welsh, who happen to have black skin, you know, people from the dominant culture are scratching their heads. You know, so even though we may be West Indian or you know, African Caribbean, that's an ethnicity and nationality would be British. So it's trying to clarify those elements as well and trying to drive home that um, black history is not just focused on uh, music, sports and drama, which comes under the title of, of the heading of entertainment. We're also going to be looking at those scientific innovators yeah, that invented things you know, male as well as female, who worked in the scientific and technological fields. So students from around the world will conceive that most of the um, mechanisms or apparatuses they use in 21st century came out of minds, whether they were slaves, whether they were the slave or the unslaved in the diaspora. And obviously trying to help to change things within the curriculum. So we want to make sure that of mice and men and to kill a mockingbird comes out of the literature, um, comes out of the schools, which are embarrassing uh, many of the kids from so-called black and brown communities. And this is this is another fight now that we're trying to engage in and trying to replace that with more authentic autobiographies, such as Frederick Douglass, Orlando Equiano, uh, Mary Seacole, and um, Booker T. Washington, you know? And the reason why I selected those was because you got an, on, you know, they were all entrepreneurial in their own way, but trying to drive, you know, you know, trying to drive their project of, of, you know, abolishing slavery. Many of them were slaves themselves. So we can see that transitioning from them to be slaves, to become literate as well, because obviously this is something I feel which is really important when we're looking at the, you know, the classical age and looking that black people actually contributed to that. So that's basically it, looking at the new Welsh curriculum and what I'm doing in order to try to enhance the learning capacity, as well as the cognitive development of pupils from the ages of three right up to 16. And I'm glad that I've, I've, I've written curriculums now for college, for, uh, for the local college in Wales, which is called Cardiff and Vale College, as well as University of South Wales, which is, um, I've put a course together. It's the first course, I think it might be the first course in the UK, focusing on mixed race people throughout the centuries from antiquity right to the contemporary. Um, so, because a lot of people who come from mixed race backgrounds are literally forced into the black camp, even though they see themselves as both. So it's trying, it's trying to give them a narrative and how they were projected and seen during that time. And using a Jamaican author, J, J, uh, Joel Rogers, J.A. Rogers' work, you know, Sex and Race, which is a three volume book where he looked at the element of miscegenation and mixed racing over the centuries in the Americas, in antiquity, in Greco-Roman, ancient, Kemetic, Nubian society, as well as the contemporary society of Black people being in diaspora. So that, that's basically it. So there's, so that there's many courses which are going to be accredited, you know, which are going to be coming out this year and so on. So it's a good thing for Wales and it'd be nice to know that England we would have thought that England would have been at the spearhead of this, but unfortunately, Wales have beaten England to that as far as making mandatory Black and African and Asian history in the, in, throughout the national curriculum or the new Welsh curriculum now, you know, which is now going to focus more on Welsh history from a, from a, from a, from a local and global perspective. And now they're going to be looking at the links that Wales have had with the Caribbean islands such as Picton and Henry Morgan of Trinidad and, and Jamaica, as well as looking at other Welsh so-called pioneers in the Caribbean islands who were associated with Wales in some way to bring out that reality, uh, you know, so we can understand that through industrialization, that's how a lot of the money came to this country from the Caribbean islands to develop it, to be the economic power that it is today. So it's putting things into historical perspective for pupils and the timeline which you which you saw will help in reassuring and reaffirming that in some way from a visual stimulus for pupils and teachers within the educational system.
It's absolutely fantastic, Appelbagger, and I'm so, so pleased that you've been able to join us today and that we've been able to get a bit of a catch up about your work because um, I've missed you. Um, yeah. So it's really lovely that you've joined again and it's brilliant to be hearing about what's going on in Wales. It really is quite special. And Thanks, I'm Liz. really proud. And there's also some, um, some money in the Tithe Fund for links between um, schools in uh, Wales and schools and education establishments and the ages. Um, so it's fascinating in other parts of the world. Um, Roxanne, I think you are next. <laughs> yes, my head's now throbbing. It, oh. we, need him, we need him to come over. We really do. Um, I don't want these to be negatives. I want these to be something we can move forward with. The first one is I don't know when it started, but there was a module um, that was developed for Goldsmiths University, and it was um, predominantly black history. And I'm not sure what's happened, but there was talk of this wonderful module that everybody was saying it's fantastic, disappearing. Um, it was something to do with, um, I don't think it was funding, it might have been the those who were delivering the module the numbers were reduced but everybody was we were so elated a module about black history at goldsmiths university may not still be there um, i went off screen because i have difficulty sometimes with academies and i actually um did a quick search and i have my evidence it says, I put in, um, do academies follow the national curriculum? And some of you might know the answers over here. <laughs> I think I've frozen. Uh, no, you haven't. It says, does the national curriculum affect academies or free schools? Academies do not have to follow the national curriculum. So they have much more flexibility about what they choose to cover. I have a problem there. They have to follow the national curriculum for English, maths and science. And their so-called flexibility, oh, you're recording this, about what they cover, that's where we need Wales to come over and say, hey, academies, you do have flexibility, but you've also got duty to the community. That's why my head's now throbbing. Academies are just walking over right, left and centre, you know, from experience, offset comes, zoom, need improvement, bam, state says, council say, why don't you become an academy? Such and such an academy is really good for you. Yeah. Okay. Come over from Wales, please. Yes, you invite me over, you know, um, I'll put my details or Liz can send you my details and uh, let's stay in contact because I want to spread this further because we do want to see England, you know, establish, you know, Black Asian minority ethnic studies within the national curriculum. We want to see a bit more flexibility, more dexterity, and we want to see um, a better understanding from a historical perspective that we're not left in this 500 year room you know, of, of slavery, enslavement and colonization. We want to go back and look at all the different sciences and disciplines, like I said, which I've written courses on. We want to look at the element of mathematics, which originated in Africa. We want to look at science, we want to look at technology, and we want to look at it from an ancient as well as a contemporary perspective in, in the roles that black people and brown people have made throughout the centuries. And this is something that many schools are embracing. There are a lot of apprehension. There's still a lot of um, what you call the opposition you know, but with it being mandatory now, you know, they're obliged in order to do that. And with the Welsh government now looking to establish an anti-racist Wales by 2030, it falls into place. Now the Welsh government is now forced in order to ensure that all schools apply to the mandatory curriculum of ensuring that Black Asian minority ethnic studies is developed and it's actually uh, delivered throughout the new Welsh curriculum. It's Sorry really, about that, my phone's going. Um, a good long time ago, we had Professor Charlotte Williams come and talk to us. Um, 
because she was leading the introduction of the um, uh, curriculum in Wales, the new curriculum in Wales. So it's fascinating. So, uh, <laughs> right. I'm going to uh, let Garrick. Uh, so thank you, Roxanne, very much for your points. And yes, I'm sure I've met Apple Bagger in, uh, in Wolverhampton before now. So maybe you'll come over to England again, maybe down to Croydon. OK, Garrick, your next point then. And then we're going to be working towards wrapping up before I fall off my perch asleep. Yeah, a um, couple of points. Um... In relation to um, the curriculum, and of course, this has been a challenge for many, many years. Um, if you remember when Michael Gove was education minister, whatever it was, you know, we tried to push, um, you know, these issues through um, Michael Gove and we draw a blank, as it were. Um, and um, a lot of what's been said, quite interesting enough, um, what Wales is doing uh, is a model for England, Scotland, and Ireland, but the reality is they're all governed by different um, um, ministers, etc. Um, there's a key element that's missing um, from what Abu has said, and um, we all know that schools are private, uh, are run privately. Um, as institutions, board of governors, et cetera. Even ed teacher don't really, you know, um, run schools uh, in terms of uh, the curriculum that's delivered. They have guidance, of course, from government. Um, and then, you know, they, they either follow it or, or, or not follow it. Um, but I think the key element that is missing from what Abu is saying is about teachers training. Now, teachers training is one of the key elements how we actually engage teachers with these issues. Uh, for many, many years, um, when I worked at John Moore University, we tried to push a lot of these issues across teachers training. And, you know, many, many individuals are still doing that. Um, Black Studies A-level was developed in Liverpool and then um, went out from Liverpool um, to Manchester and to Birmingham before it became part of a, uh, Birmingham took it as, as a um, uh, A-level and then um, uh, degree uh, level. It was developed through the Charles Wharton College, the only black college in Liverpool that was named after the seaman that was chased and murdered in Liverpool. Uh, chasing from the docks all the way up towards Parliament Street, which is now known to be Toxet area, etc. Um, and we pushed very hard to get the A-level um, Black Studies accredited, and we achieved that. But then the college folded many years after, so the college is gone. At that particular time, the um, our um, president was um, our um, first uh, Black MP, Bernie Grant. So Bernie Grant was, was our president for many years. But this issue about the curriculum is a constant issue because although teachers have the flexibility of delivering a balanced curriculum, there are two issues. They're guided by government and they're also lack of training. And it's very difficult for teachers to deliver something that they don't understand or don't know much about. Black teachers can deliver an inclusive curriculum, but the school, because it's managed by board of governors, cannot deliver that. So there lies the issue. So these are complex issues that we need to address. And, you know, for many years, myself, um, uh, Wally Brown and other people have pushed towards improving teachers training. And we need to engage with all the teachers union in order to try and, you know, keep mobilized and make sure 
that the curriculum is inclusive. It's not about you know, teaching a bit about slavery as David Cameron and whatever talk about. It has to be a much inclusive curriculum from key stage one, two, three, all the way up. I think that's our challenge. Thank you very much indeed, Garrick. Um, I've spoken with Apu Bagger a lot of times and I know that teacher training is very much on the agenda in Wales as well. So Apu, I won't ask you to come back in on that one. Uh, anyway, so that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Roxanne. Thank you so much for your contributions. Um, uh, June Elizabeth, thank you for being with us again. That's absolutely brilliant. McCarpy, thank you very much indeed. And I do hope, McCarpy, that you're um, going to get some resolution of the financial, of the um, legal challenges that you're facing there of that land that I know you and your, your colleagues um, have been are concerned with. Um, it's always great to have you, David, join us. Ella, I'm delighted you joined us. Roland has put a note in the uh, chat to say about the next um, uh, Justice for Windrush Generations um, session, which is um, assisted um, Justice for Windrush Generations and Sister Jasmine present the African Diaspora Windrush Scheme Monday chat. Um, that's a different one than Monday. That's on this Monday coming, the 20th, 12 noon. So all the details are there in that um, that uh, um, input on the chat. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Wilton. You put in a, a big long uh, comment for us as well. So people can read up about that in your contact details. Um, have I thanked everybody? I now need to say the biggest thank you to Michael for joining us. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, Apple Bagger, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Uh, Simon, <laughs> I hope we haven't overrun our time too badly. We have a bit, but uh, thanks ever so much anyway, everybody. So next week and the week after, um, we've got um, some folks booked into. Um, contribute but we've also got opportunities to uh, reflect a little bit and as Garrick says uh, you know there's a great deal to be done to to get to a wider audience and so that's yeah. one looking please at. can I say can I yeah. say something quickly please yes yeah um quickly um yes Abu Bakr um fanta a, a great session and what I think we need to look at is, I think we're looking at it like, you're looking at it like education, formal education, getting into schools. But these things need to, uh, I mean, adults don't know these things. You understand what I'm saying? So it has to be at a community um, level, yeah. right? That, you know, that we educate, it. it's like, you gotta look at it like we're educating the, the community in inverted commas. And uh, education stops as a, at the grave, as Alice and Lassie said. And um, I think that's the way we should should approach it because um, it's not just the children that need to know it. I think the adults need to know it as well. And that's yeah. it. Give thanks. Yeah, yeah I, I well, totally Sam agree. Thumbs up to that as well. Apple Baggers nodding his head too. And I think it's really true. And I think that people like yourself, McCarpy, as a performer, McCarpy is um, a dub poet, um, sharing your stories. Um, I learned so much from some of those sessions that you you did, your poem about your father, other things that just, you know, really resonate. So it's finding different ways to get to people. And there's always the telly as well, but now we don't have uh, a big you watching only a few channels. There's so much opportunity to flick over and watch something else, but uh, there's all sorts of ways to get this over. But the important thing is like Apple Bag has done, is to do the research into the black history and make sure we got the information that we were able to share with people. And uh, it's brilliant, Michael, the work you've done and your interest and enthusiasm and different approaches, different ways of getting the stories over. So thanks ever so much, everybody. And I'll see you next week. Okay? Thank you. All the best. Thank then. you, Liz. Thank Thanks you. Well. One Bye -bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. 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 Thank you, Simon. Bye.